All right. Welcome to NAMI Cook County North Suburban's last webinar for 2020. Our program tonight is Fix What You Can, Schizophrenia and a Lawmaker's Fight for Her Son. We're glad you could join us tonight. I'm Dr. Christine Somerville, Director of Programs at NAMI. For those of you who don't know about us, NAMI is the largest mental health organization in the country. And we are, for many, um, their first call after getting a diagnosis when they don't know what to do next. We are with them through their journey of finding the best way to care for someone with a mental health condition and for themselves if they have a diagnosis. We do this through our warm line, our free, free peer-led support groups, classes, and community education forums like this one tonight. So tonight's program is part of our author's series with our guest speaker who has written a memoir. Mindy Greiling's memoir, Fix What You Can, Schizophrenia and a Lawmaker's Fight for Her Son, chronicles her family's experience and legislative work in the Minnesota House of Representatives. Ms. Grayling will highlight her advocacy work and importance of everyone advocating for both, both personally and for a better mental health system. Tonight's format will be the following. We will have um, a talk for approximately 30 or 45 minutes and then an open question and answering time to follow. There'll be plenty of time for questions. Um, we are hoping that you will engage with us and ask your questions. Please use the chat box at the bottom of your screen to type in your questions, and then we will field them at the end. So I'd like now to introduce our speaker, Mindy Grilling. In addition to being a published author, worked as a legislator in the Minnesota House of Representatives. She worked at the state level during her 20 years in the legislature, and after she left elected office, has worked locally. She is the president of NAMI Ramsey and an active member of the League of Women Voters, where she co-chaired local studies on police interactions during mental health crises and on affordable housing. So it is my pleasure to welcome Mindy Greiling. Thank you very much, Christine, and good evening to everybody. I am so pleased that we have such a great audience it was in the dark of December. And I'm going to start out by putting up my PowerPoint here, which is always the truth. What you can uh, is a very appropriate title for, for my memoir, because all of us in this group most of us anyway, probably know you can't fix everything about the mental health system. And you certainly can't do it all at once. And you can't fix everything about whoever you are concerned about who has a mental illness, whether it's yourself, a family member, or a friend. So fix what you can is an appropriate, appropriate, appropriate title. And the best way that I deal with mental illness, and I think the best way to advocate, which is what I've been asked to focus this talk on tonight, is by sharing my story. When I was in the legislature, I never suffered in silence. I couldn't if I'd wanted to. I think people can relate. When you're dealing with something like schizophrenia, you really if you bottled it all up, I think you would explode. So, um, so I never suffered in silence. I shared it with my legislative colleagues. And whenever um, we were dealing with any mental health legislation, I was able to share personal experience. We always had wonderful groups like NAMI and others who gave the big picture and the facts and figures, um, but Sharing stories is what moves elected officials the most. If you can play on their heartstrings and their emotions, they're more apt to do something with the facts and figures and statistics that are so, so blatant in this illness. 
Um, when our son first got sick, oh, well, I was lucky when our son first was diagnosed in 1999 with schizophrenia to be a state legislator in the Minnesota House of Representatives. And here I am, you can see that was when I started being a legislator back in um, actually 1992. And I so I'd already been in the legislature from um, for seven years, um, three and a half terms when Jim first got sick, which was a good thing because I had my footing there. I had my relationships with my colleagues. I'd earned some stripes. And so when Jim got sick, I was able to actually do some things right away. And then I was there for seven more terms, 14 more years after he got sick. So I had a lot of chances to improve the mental health system. And the first, um, the first thing that I ever worked on, which I think a lot of people can relate to, was the poor communication that exists in the mental health system. Jim had gone to the psych ward after a big crisis where we had to call the police and the, um, the uh, crisis team came, the police came and he was hauled off to the psych ward in the ambulance and what, he went voluntarily actually by the time they got there and admitted he was hearing voices. And then he went into the vacuum of the psych ward where um, I called to find out what was going on. We did not go with the crisis team and the, the police. We were left at home. And so I called to see how he was doing, figuring we could catch up with him there and, and go down and, and start working on things. And instead, the person who answered the phone in the psych ward started to tell me that how the gym wasn't doing very well and then she checked on her records and noticed that uh, she noticed that she that Jim hadn't signed a release of information. But at the time, she didn't tell me that. She just said, "Oh, I can't talk to you because your son is, is an adult." And so I say in my book, um, "I wish I had a dollar for every time I had to try to communicate with somebody in the mental health system about our son." So um, that was the first piece of legislation I worked on. And I want to um, read a couple of passages from the book. I'm going to read three passages tonight. And this is the first one. Um, after I had run into this, this problem with communication. I was never one to take things lying down or to assume that the way things were always had to be. I had been on the school board where some people had wrung their hands about the legislature and its edicts, but I was inspired to run for state representative. I was glad now I was at the Capitol. I vowed to look into this ridiculous situation after I had regrouped. Of course, I had to regroup because uh, my son had just gone to the psych ward. We just found out he was hearing voices and um, and we didn't yet have a diagnosis. Here's the second passage that I will read. And it's after I did regroup, Jim had was still in the psych ward, but he had calmed down. He was getting some medication and we were starting to learn about things. I spent a lot of time reading books, looking at the NAMI website and so forth. Um, and Advocacy is always what makes me feel better. And so that's what I turn to now being a legislator. I was lucky to be able to do that. The only thing that lightened my heart was having something real to do that day. I was meeting with the legislative staff attorney who covered the privacy statutes. After she came into the room, I said, I want to make a bill I want a bill to make psych wards do better with medical information releases. I briefly explained what had happened when Jim began his psych ward stint. It seems like plain old common sense. 
to me. Many laws are common sense written down, the staff person said with a laugh. I liked her even more. Many laws are, and many are based on a legislator's personal experience or those of their constituents, I smiled. At times, certainly, she smiled back. And so I had, even though our family was in huge turmoil and distress at home, I had the wonderful satisfaction of coming up with a bill. We weren't able to, this was before HIPAA, by the way, but even so, it was difficult to communicate. And But we were able to draft a bill that said hospitals, if family members inquired and wanted to communicate, had to explain about medical releases of information. They couldn't just say, we can't talk to you. They had to say, your son hasn't yet signed a medical release. They also had to ask the person to sign a release of information. It turned out actually they had never asked Jim. He was in such bad shape when he came in that they didn't ask him. And then once he was better, they never asked him either. They just didn't bother and it didn't seem to be high on their list to communicate with me. So we said they had to ask, they had to explain to parents what it meant. And then parents and staff people could encourage the person to sign a release as they got better in the psych ward. And that's what happened with Jim. The first time he was even asked to sign a release, he willingly did. He was glad to have the support of his family talking to these all these strange professionals that he was dealing with for the first time too. So that was an advocacy that, um, that I really, really enjoyed being able to do. The second piece of legislation I worked on right off the bat was when I started speaking about our son's mental illness and people with mental illness uh, back in 1999, I was not educated enough to put the person first. So instead of saying people with a mental illness, I said the mentally ill. And of course, the mental health community quickly um, called my, my error and said, you know, put the person first. You don't say the cancerous person or something like that or the cancer. And so, um, so I actually drafted a bill and passed it. Also, like I did the first one, fairly without too much trouble, almost everybody agreed that there needed to be communication. Everybody agreed that there needed to be person first language. So we made all the Minnesota statutes. Um, the revisor's office had to spend the next summer and fall changing them all to put people with um, mental illness, a mental illness or mental illnesses first instead of all the places in the statute where it said the mentally ill. So I had a lot of um, fun with both of those bills. And I, every time we ran into a problem, I would um, do legislation. And the third bill that I did was not quite so much fun and it wasn't quite so widely embraced. And people here, many of you might know, um, know why, because I was working on changing the civil commitment statutes so there could be earlier help. Our son um, didn't recognize he was ill and by this time, I'd heard from many families to reinforce that that was a common problem for people with things like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder or depression with psychotic features. They would have anosognosia, which means their brain is not allowing them to know that they're sick, even though they are very sick. So um, we wanted to not have them have to rise to being imminently dangerous to self or others before they could get some help, even if they didn't recognize that they needed it. So that was the next bill I worked on and it took a couple of years with us having to form a huge coalition and really re-educating a lot of people in the, in the legislature about 
there are times when, when this is needed and helpful. And um, finally, we passed, we took out the word imminent, which almost every state has done now. But back then, almost every state had imminently dangerous to their themselves or others. So now almost every state, except for like three, I think, have just say dangerous to self or others, but you don't have to be imminently dangerous. And we also added a property damage provision because Jim had um, done damage to our house and punched some holes in the walls. And this is pretty common with people new to the illness who aren't doing well. And, but yet that did not count as showing how sick he was when that was a huge red flag. He didn't ever do that before. So that property damage held a lot of people. And that's a, a criteria for civil commitment that that is not in a lot of state statutes. I don't know about Illinois. Maybe someone can tell me when we get to Q&A if that's a provision. But um, that, was, that was huge. And we also had the uh, Jarvis hearing and the civil commitment hearing be simultaneous. It didn't seem sensible to civilly commit somebody and then wait a long time before they could actually get any medication to help them. So that's those are some of the things I worked on in the early days. Then um, when I started working on this book, like I said, the best type of advocacy that I do and that I encourage everybody to do is share our stories and Sharing Stories Moves Legislators, and another subplot for the book, the memoir that I wrote when I took classes at a place in Minneapolis, and I'm sure every state has a similar wonderful place where you can learn to write a book. And there they said, um, stories are the best, fastest path to empathy. So that's in addition to changing and improving the mental health system, I wrote this book so people could empathize with how Jim feels and how um, his illness has made life hard for him, but what he's still capable of and be empathetic and not mad at him or afraid of him. And then also for, uh, for families who need empathy as well. Everybody suffers when somebody's that sick in the family. And since, um, the story is, you know, my memoir about my suffering and, and all the things I was going through in our family. It's also even more so a Jim's story. So he helped me write the book. And if any of you have read it, you know that um, there are some parts that are pretty graphic and raw. And I really could not have included those in the book if I hadn't gotten Jim's permission, because those parts really are his story, I wanted to include them because they would then show the depth of how sick he was and how it affected our family. But without his permission, I don't know that I would have been as comfortable or as free to do that. But luckily, Jim said, well, it's kind of embarrassing, but if it helps other people, I guess so. And then he went ahead and um, edited the chapters, except for my writing group. He was the first one to see most of the chapters. And um, he thought the ones about the legislature were the most boring, by the way. <laughs> and he liked the ones about himself the best. I'm gonna go over these um, next slides a little bit faster since I'm focusing on advocacy. And this is a NAMI group, so this is probably not news to you or your supporters who are here. But here's Jim when he was about 20, um, and he had been having trouble with using um, street drugs in high school. He had used marijuana and other a lot of other drugs, but he managed to um, be look healthy and seemed healthy other than that, which we thought was akin to using alcohol in our day. So um, we didn't start with that, my husband and I, when we were in ninth grade, like Jim did with marijuana. But um, by the time we, we weren't aware he was using them, but by the time we were, we didn't take it as seriously as we should have because we didn't know that marijuana, unlike alcohol, has a huge effect, a lot of research to show 
on developing brains. And um, NAMI in Minnesota, at least, is lobbying if we legalize marijuana, recreational marijuana, not just medical marijuana, which we have, that um, young adults shouldn't be using it until they're at least 25 when the brain is, is developed. But Jim was using it when his brain was developing. And um, so that's, here he is looking pretty healthy. A year later, you can see he's starting to um, show signs of not being as healthy, but we were, didn't realize it at the time until he started to sound like my grandmother. And I have a, a, a underlying story where I talk about her in, and then how it scares me that Jim might be like her. My grandmother went to the, hosp the state hospital when um, I was in fifth grade, 10 years old, 11 years old, and uh, she was there for 23 years. And she heard the radio talking to her. And Jim, when he was calling from college, said that he heard um, people talking in the next door apartment and he could hear them and then that reminded me of my grandmother. That's when we started to have a clue. And he did, um, it ended up with a huge episode. He ended up in jail in college in Montana so I had to go and retrieve him. And then he took medicine and got, got somewhat better. Here he is after he came home from jail before he actually started the medicine. And he's sitting in my chair on the House of Representatives floor and I use this one to illustrate, which again is no news to this group, but people with mental illness can look perfectly normal. And it's hard for others to realize they're sick. And that's part of why people don't think they need early intervention. They don't seem that sick yet and they need to get dangerous or something. But Jim here is uh, pretty psychotic and is probably listening to voices and that might be what he's smiling at rather than his mother speaking to this group, but it, it, it was not, not evident. When he got on medication, um, right away he started gaining weight. He gained a lot of weight. I use that as an example of why people don't wanna stay on their medicine besides thinking that they feel, feel better. And he became allergic to um, clozapine and then lost the weight but his mind didn't work as well. Here, um, he's um, going on a solo camping trip back to Montana where he thinks the world is perfect. And um, he had some rough episodes out there, but we had no ability to have him not go. Back to advocacy, um, here's Jim's sister again on the right. She's Angela, she's two years older than him. She is a reporter, now she's an editor in um, Washington, D.C. And here she covered um, a paper at that time in Minnesota. It's former, the late Senator Paul Wellstone from Minnesota who worked a lot on things like mental health parity. And Angela was able to, to um, tell him about her brother. She said he was the first person she told and he knew just what to say because he has a brother who has, um, has mental illness as well. But he's a great advocate. I got to have a press conference with him on mental health parity and, um, and he, he was the, you know, my favorite advocate uh, for mental illness nationally. And um, I have some slides in here making a point that mental illness affects the whole family including um, Angela's husband and, and daughter, our granddaughter, and that it's hard for parents when um, you have a high achieving um, child who reached their full potential, and then you have your other, fam your other child who developed schizophrenia, had a lot of promise all through life, and then, um, then has to struggle to do, um, to do anything, but can have great success. Jim has worked full-time, he's worked part-time, he's currently working part-time. But in between um, some of these years, he's had a lot of struggles, which you can see, see in the book if you have read it or if you will read it. And all along, when we're having all these problems with our son, 
with um, continued drug use and getting kicked out of his employment program and having a, a some sort of a sociopath move in to his apartment and uh, different episodes where he ended up burglarizing our house at the end all along there I am um, advocating in the legislature, the place where I can feel like I'm doing something. And I think that is, it is a comfort to advocate for everybody. You can't fix the mental illness of your family member or your own mental illness. If you have a mental illness, you can't fix it perfectly. You can treat the symptoms, but you can also advocate to fix the mental health system and that can make you feel better. You can help yourself and others. And so I left the legislature actually eight years ago. And um, when I was retiring and giving my retirement speech, um, I told my colleagues that they needed to do right by the mental health system or I would come back and haunt the hallways and haunt them until they did right. And so while I was um, in the legislature, for those 14 years, um, we passed we passed a lot of really good legislation. Um, we had my favorite bill was one on postpartum depression. I had a a man who came to me. He actually was not my constituent, but he was he knew I worked on um, mental health legislation, and so he came to me and said his wife after they had their baby. Um, developed postpartum depression, and he wanted to do something about that so other families wouldn't have to go through what he had gone through and what she had gone through. And so they, we said that hospitals had to provide information and tell people about the possibility of this illness developing. And that was a really fun piece of legislation because it was like my first two where the the um, legislators embraced it. I don't think anybody opposed it. Even the hospitals thought it was a good idea, even though they had to do one more thing. And then we also um, did a lot of comprehensive reforms. We had, um, I developed a bipartisan mental health caucus and invited another, um, a chair actually from the Senate who chaired the Health and Human Services Committee and she and I um, were the two Democrats. Each of us in the House and the Senate invited a Republican leader on mental health issues. So we had four chairs, Senate, House, Republican, Democrat. And then we um, invited members of the legislature to join. And we had a very large caucus. Um, and we copied actually the Congressional Mental Health Caucus. They had one and still do. And that was what we patterned it after. As far as I know, no other state has actually done that. And when I left, um, ours has actually fallen into disuse. You have to have somebody really pushing it. And um, But it's still got so many legislators involved. NAMI and other groups could bring their legislation to our meetings and easily get the bill signed. And they loved, you know, cutting to the chase because they knew all the legislators there were interested in improving the mental health system. And then they could tell about their bills and legislators could come up and, and sign the ones that they wanted to. So that was a huge effort. And that's why we got so much done because we worked uh, bipartisanly. We could do that in those days at least. And, um, and I don't, mental illness should not be a partisan um, because it affects everybody. So um, that was a, something I was very proud of. And we, we, had, um, we had loan forgiveness programs for more professionals of color. That is something we still need to do more with. Um, but, but we started a lot of things. We had um, teachers having the ability to be educated enough to flag kids who might be having trouble and then refer them on to the school support staff. And then we also had uh, funding for school support staff. Teachers, it doesn't do them any good to flag somebody if there's no one to refer the family to. Um, we had um, funding and policy to encourage work for people. 
according to NAMI, 85% of the people with serious mental illness want to work and yet very few of them are. So we wanted to incent in supportive employment programs. We had funding for peer specialists. Um, we had um, all kinds of things that we did. Suicide prevention, we had um, CIT training for police officers even before it was as prominently important as it is in 2020. We, we here in Minnesota had the George Floyd situation and um, we worked on mental health parity, lots of things, all because we worked together and because I kept telling my story and some other legislators started doing that too, which I, people that I had no idea had personal experience, which shouldn't be a surprise because many people have personal experience. I'm gonna read the last short quote from the book. Um, and that is um, from towards the end of my book, because when I left the legislature, I still wanted to advocate. And yet when you're not at the table, it's a little harder to do. So here I say in my epilogue, we still need many more people to share their stories, stories that will stick in their elected officials' heads. It is harder to work as a civilian than it was to act in the political ring. I will admit that freely. Now that I'm no longer a legislator, when I want to change something, I have to rouse other horses instead of galloping ahead myself, but it can be done. And that's, um, that's definitely the message that, that I want to have first and foremost. Here's Jim when he moved into his apartment. I also, um, after almost 10 years of not having one and having a, being in a lot of trouble. And um, so I always encourage advocacy for our own family members too. You have to fight and claw if you're going to get anything and we know how scarce affordable housing is. Okay. There's a picture of Jim um, when he, that he hung in his first, first, oh, I guess now this is really running ahead. I pressed it three times, okay. Um, so I've got two more slides and then we'll get to the questions. But here I include this slide um, because of the police cars in the background. Christine said when she introduced me that I, um, advocate now at the local level, and I chaired two studies for the League of Women Voters. And my message here is everywhere you go, whatever organization you're involved in, if you really think about it, you can often find a way to advocate within the bounds of those organizations for mental illness. Um, so with, for the League of Women Voters, our local chapter, I chaired um, with, I co-chaired um, a study on the police and we studied how they dealt with people in a mental health crisis and also um, how the police were racial pro racially profiling people and we also looked at domestic abuse crises which often involve mental illness too. And um, so that was very satisfying. We made recommendations, we dealt with our local officials and then um, a month after that report came out, we had the Philandro Castile situation in Minnesota where he got shot and, and killed by a police officer just being stopped for a traffic stop. So that was a very important re report. And then um, next, I, we had, I co-chaired one on affordable housing and that I felt was such a need because we had so much trouble getting affordable housing for Jim. He had a housing voucher, not Section 8. Those are impossible to get. But we have something in Minnesota called a bridging voucher, which is the same thing, but it's funded uh, by the state. And Jim had one of those, but we couldn't find any landlords who would accept it and take him. Um, and so I had to really rattle cages and try hard and get people to um, see the need for affordable housing. And Jim got one of those slots. So locally, you can still do things. And then um, 
the very last slide. Like you, I'm active in NAMI now. I'm the president, as Christine said, of the NAMI Ramsey, my county affiliate. I love our shirt, you are not alone. And we just had a listening session for people to tell their stories last month about interactions with the police. And we've written up the report. We'll be approving it at our board meeting next Monday night, and then we'll share it with our law enforcement and our elected officials. I love to advocate. It's the thing that makes me feel the best and I fix what I can with the mental health system and with our son. And I will end on this note before we go to questions um, that right now our son Jim is doing really well. If you've read the book, you see that um, he's just restarted clozapine and he's broken up with a very destructive relationship and using a lot of crack. And so for the last year, at least, he's been sober, he's working part-time, he did stay out of that relationship. He's a sweet person um, that he always has been. And um, I worship Clozapine, actually. He had been on it one other time, but got allergic to it. But we thank our lucky stars for now. We know when you're dealing with an illness like schizophrenia that it may not last forever. Uh, we take what we can get and, and um, are so happy for it. So I'm going to end here and hope that, that we have a lot of good dialogue. The question and answer part is always my favorite part of speaking to groups, especially NAMI groups. Well, we have a lot of questions that have come in. Um, so let's get to them now. And okay. I'm going to just, I'm going to be the one to to moderate so you don't have to do that. You can just simply respond. Um, so uh, let's see, the first one, how did Jim fare when he went to Montana by himself? Um, so probably this is the question about when he went camping rather than when he went back to college. So um, I wrote about in the book when he went back to college. So. I'm gonna talk about when he went camping in Montana, which I think the question might be asking. I had a whole chapter about this in my book too, but I, it was sliced by an editor. I, about a good third of my book that I first wrote isn't there anymore. And um, this one was one of my favorite chapters. But Jim went back, um, his program that he was in at the time and when he was doing pretty well, didn't think he should go by himself to camping to Montana. He took his car, he had a car at the time, drove to Montana, and he was um, he was marginal because he had the meds he were, was on were not covering all of his symptoms. But we did not have the ability to say no, you know, he had the right to go. His program could not say no. He wasn't committed. He was uh, had vacation. So so he went and we Roger and I actually um, helped fund part of the trip. We took a risk, on, even though the program didn't want him to, and, um, and helped him to get there because he loves the mountains. We so wanted him to have a chance to be there. And he had someone to go with him, but that person thinked out at the last minute. So Jim went and we got him a satellite radio so that we could rest easy by hearing from him pretty much every day. So he would call home with things like, um, I got a speeding ticket as soon as I got to Missoula. I can't go camping until Monday after I've been to court for this speeding ticket. <laughs> and um, I forgot my toothbrush and everything back in Wyoming. So I had to go back and then I'm late. And so, and then he got on the trail finally and he said, I ran across a mother bear and two cubs and she came at me because I wasn't making enough noise. But don't worry, um, I just walked slowly away and she went away. <laughs> and he lost his backpack um, in the mountains and, he, and then he had to climb to a higher point before he could find it. He wasn't sure he could and then he wouldn't have been able to make his water safe and things. So, so in the end, um, that was a very hair-raising trip. 
And I did do the right thing by letting him go, but he was so happy. And um, we are a family of risk takers. We, we don't want to squash him and think he can't do things just because he has, has a mental illness. But it was a chapter that was cut, but it was kind of funny and it was very scary at the same time. I don't recommend it actually, even though we're glad Jim had the chance to go. So I, before we go on to the next question, I want to stop the recording here. And I want to just thank you on the recording, and then we'll go back to the next question. So thank you, Mindy. Okay.